on page 1019 is uh, our reading for this morning's scripture. I do encourage you to get in the habit of uh, either using one of the Bibles that we have for you, or if you have a Bible at home, uh, especially if it's in the English Standard Version for the um, sake of all being on the same page, uh, then bring it with you and get in the habit of, as I say something from the scripture, check to see if it's actually what the Bible says. And that way you can be uh, more confident in knowing that our teaching is sound and also that you're actually hearing more what God has to say to you than what some guy with a microphone has to say. Nobody really cares what Joe Haynes has to say, but we all must care deeply about what the Lord has said. Right? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Well, this morning, um, this passage of scripture is a kind of a doozy, and so we need to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so gracious to us in speaking. From the very beginning, Lord, you have made known your commands. You have reached out and formed relationship with your people. We thank you most of all that the lost state of our world, the corruption and guilt in our world because of sin, uh, that you have stepped in and given us a redeemer. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you, Father and Son, that you have given us your Holy Spirit. That the Spirit, we thank you, uh, Holy Spirit, for giving us these words of Scripture through your servant Peter. And now we ask for understanding. We ask that these words would penetrate our hearts and minds and accomplish in us what you've intended these words to do. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, I've titled this sermon, uh, the series is called, uh, the whole series is Knowing Jesus at the End of the World, and this uh, title for the series was kind of chosen from this particular passage. So this passage is particularly Knowing Jesus Until the End of the World. As we approach uh, the, the end of this series, there's only one more sermon in Second Peter after this one. And uh, I want you to see how Peter has defined uh, both salvation and judgment. Throughout this letter, because that's what it is, it's a letter written to a group of churches in a, in a broad region. Uh, t- today we would call that uh, much of modern day Turkey. Uh, but uh, this letter then is written with uh, themes running all the way through it. And the themes of salvation and judgment are defined not in terms, and this is kind of shocking. It's even more shocking, if I may say so, because uh, we're sharing the building uh, this morning with the Intuitive Arts Festival. And uh, it's kind of shocking, given the worldviews that are commonly uh, brought forward into this festival. This is sort of shocking that Peter's defining in salvation and judgment not in terms of being good people or bad people. As if the difference between the worst of us and the best of us it makes any real difference. It's such a small difference between the most evil of us and the most righteous of us. But Peter has rather defined salvation and judgment in terms and of, of knowing Jesus Christ, whether you know Christ or not. And not knowing about him like you can look up something on Wikipedia, but actually knowing him. Like, maybe, maybe marriage is a bit of a glimpse at this, of knowing your spouse. We understand each other's moods. We, we know something of each other's character, and the, the progress of time teaches us to trust that person's character and, and to rely on that person. Something like that, but in a much more profound way, is true of knowing Christ Jesus. And this is how Peter gets at salvation and judgment. It's about whether or not we know Jesus. Now we saw a couple of weeks ago, if you look back at chapter 3, verse 3, Peter predicts that there will be scoffers that will come about in the last days scoffing, following their own sinful desires. I, I take it that we are living in, in or approximate to those last days. We certainly do see the kinds of scoffing that Peter predicts in those verses uh, very common in our culture and around the world. We also saw in chapter 2, verse 1, that Peter predicted a rise of false teachers, not in the last days, but it, probably not long after his departure from this earth, he saw and foresaw through the Holy Spirit that there would be false teachers emerging within the communities of Christian churches. So false teachers and scoffers and what Peter is kind of bringing us to now at this pivotal point in chapter 3 is that the real problem of both 
uh, false teachers and scoffers is not that they've got something wrong about history or that they hadn't studied their systematic theologies quite well enough or, you know, it's not about what they know. It's not about other problems in their theology. It really comes down to that they did not properly know Jesus Christ. They were wrong about him. That's why he gives us verse 8 the way he does. I'm kind of jumping right in with very little introduction because there's a lot to say this morning. Look with me at verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. I want you to sort of not get all confused about the thousand years and the day and the day and the thousand years right now. That's secondary. We'll get to that. Look what he says, though. Do not overlook this one fact, that with the Lord, so he's telling us something about the Lord. Who's the Lord? The Lord is Jesus. Peter is saying, do not overlook this one fact. It's about Jesus. There's something you need to know about Jesus. In other words... The problem the scoffers had made, or rather the mistake the scoffers had made, was not that they didn't know history. Although they mocked history, they said the world's gone on just as it has ever since the beginning of creation. We should not expect anything significant to change. And Peter says they'd overlooked the flood, which was kind of a big deal. The global flood, you know, that wiped out all of mankind at that time, except for eight people. That was a big deal. Peter's saying they're they're ignorant deliberately of this history. But he says that's not the real problem. The real problem is that they don't know Jesus, which is why in verse 8 he says, but you, let's stop talking about the scoffers and start talking about you. You do not overlook this. Do not overlook this. Overlook, Overlook it where? What would these Christian churches be doing? What would these Christian individuals be doing at which time they might run the risk of overlooking something significant about Jesus in verse 8? Peter has said in the first couple of verses in chapter 3, this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember, A, the predictions of the holy prophets, and B, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, that you should remember the prophetic Old Testament and the apostolic New Testament, that you would remember the Bible. He's stirring us up. And I said last week, and it's still true, I don't know why you didn't learn. I said last week, you don't look stirred up. You don't look stirred up. But Peter wants us to be stirred up. He wants us to be stirred up, not just so that we're all happy clappy, but so that we are grounded in the Old and New Testaments of Scripture. That we take the Word of God and we hang on to it. And while we are learning the word of God so that we can recall it to mind, and while we are learning the commandments of our Lord and Savior through his apostles so that we can obey the commandment, while we are doing these things, which involves reading and learning the Bible, Peter says in verse 8, but you, beloved, do not overlook this one fact. There's something that in your Bible reading you need to notice because you'll come across it in your Bible reading. It's there. Don't overlook it when you see it. It's about Jesus. There's something you need to know about Jesus. That's why verse 8 tells us what it's like for Jesus to wait a couple of thousand years before keeping his promise to return. If we didn't know Jesus, we might come to wrong conclusions about why it's been so long. If we know what the Bible says about Jesus, it will keep us from reaching wrong conclusions about why the apparent delay. In light of my title knowing Jesus until the end of the world. Let me just briefly, very briefly remind you how strongly Peter has emphasized that every grace from God, like every, think of the graces of God that you have enjoyed. Every grace from God, says Peter, every blessing and every aspect of salvation comes through knowing Jesus. Again, not knowing about him, but knowing him. The word in Greek is different from the word for normal knowing, which would be from the root word gnosis. This is epignosis, something about particular knowledge, relatable knowledge, personal knowledge. 
knowing Jesus in the epignosis kind of way. Look with me, 10 times Peter in this letter has emphasized this kind of special knowing of Jesus. He said in chapter 1, verse 2, that's how we grow in grace and peace, is through knowing Jesus, the knowledge of Jesus. In the next verse, chapter 1, verse 3, he said that's how we received all of God's gifts, everything we need for life and, life and salvation. Chapter 1, verse 3, is through knowing Jesus. In chapter 1, verse 5, 6, and 8, he says, Growing and knowing Jesus is necessary to being effect- effective and spiritually fruitful. If we wonder, why am I such a, like a, a bad Christian? Why do I seem to have no fruit in my life? And, and I just, I can't even seem to pray like other Christians do. And, you know, there's no growth. I, I believe in the Lord, but you would think there'd be some change in my life because of him. He says, we lack change, we lack fruit, we lack progress in the faith because we don't know Jesus. It's through knowing Jesus and being rooted in him. We find that, I preached on that when we, had, when we looked at verses 5, 6, and 8 of chapter 1. And then he says, knowing Jesus is essential in verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9. It's essential to enjoying the assurance that our sins are forgiven. That remembering that he's cleansed us of our former sins. No, it's knowing Jesus that gives us that confidence. And if I can say this, this is a wonderful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This does not say that our religion is better than other religions because we're smarter. Or that we Christians have learned more than other people and so God loves us because of it. Our studiousness. No. This verse reminds us in chapter 1 verse 9 that all of us have sins that Christ has cleansed. The difference between a happy Christian and a miserable Christian, the difference between a fruitful Christian and an unfruitful Christian is therefore whether we have remembered that he has cleansed us of our former sins and whether we go on remembering that. It's about knowing Jesus. He says, knowing Jesus in chapter 1, verse 12 and 16 is the most basic part of believing the gospel in the first place. It's foundational. It's where we begin. It's in which we were established. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, and again in chapter 3, verse 4, this is where the false teachers and scoffers go wrong. It's because they get the master wrong. They deny the master. They don't know what he's like and who he is. And in chapter uh, 3, verse 4, it's because they don't know who he is, so therefore they get history wrong and they don't trust his promise that he is coming again. It's about knowing Jesus. Okay? Chapter 3, verse 18. Rod preached this several weeks ago as he came to serve on a Sunday morning. And he preached this passage and he said, We can't grow in grace without knowing Jesus. And that's why Peter wrote this letter. So that we would grow in grace through knowing Jesus. Which leads to the, uh, really begs the immediate question, the question that we should all now be asking, and if I asked at the count of three to tell me the question that comes to mind immediately, we would all say together, what's Jesus like? That would be the question, right? Okay, one, two, three. What's Jesus like? See, I knew that you would say that. And that's the answer that I have on the screen is, do you know Jesus or not? Do you know what he's like? This is why Peter says in verse 8, in all your Bible reading, you must not overlook something that's true about Jesus. Learn what he's like in this area. What is Jesus like? Verses 8 and 9. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Verse 2 says that Peter wrote this to stir up his readers to know the Bible so that we can know the word of Christ, what Christ has spoken to us. We can know the scriptures. This is the only way to keep your Christian hope strong no matter how long it takes Jesus to come back. And in verse 8, Peter says there's something about Jesus we need to notice when we're reading the Bible. He's timeless. 
see those of you who are in our Grudem Saturday morning theology uh, discussion group, uh, you, you kind of saw a couple heads kind of pop up because we learned that word, that doctrine in our theology group that Jesus is timeless. Look with me again at verse 8 and notice how it says this. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Does that mean that Jesus doesn't know anything about years and days? No. That means the way Jesus experiences years and days. It's, it's one day is like a thousand years in his experience, and a thousand years is like one day in his experience. What does that mean? Peter's saying from the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is something you could have picked up if you've been reading and noticing it. Don't overlook this one fact. From the Old Testament and the New Testament, Peter says, that with one, the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Do you remember where Frodo says to Gandalf, and this is a Lord of the Rings reference, if you haven't read the books, I highly commend them to you. <laughs> better than the movies, and I don't remember if it's actually like this in the books as it is in the movies, but where Frodo says to Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings that Gandalf is late. You remember it, don't you? Yeah. And I won't, we won't go into exactly how Gandalf says that because I, I felt that it's somehow inappropriate for church. Um, but where Gandalf answers that he's not late, he's arriving precisely when he intended. See, this is how we think about the coming of Christ. We think he's late. And Jesus is telling us through his Holy Spirit who gave these words of scripture to Peter and now Peter's telling us, beloved, don't overlook this fact. He's not late. He's arriving precisely when he intends. To Jesus, he will be right on time. Verse 8 actually has a command in it. Do not overlook this fact, brothers, this one fact, beloved. Do not overlook this. You must not. That's a command in Greek. That when we learn the Bible, we must see what it teaches us about the timelessness of Jesus Christ with the Lord. What time is like for him? Because for the Lord, a long time and a short time are all the same. He experiences them in the same way. He is not affected by time like we are. The reason why is because he is God. Would we think that God is affected by time in the same way that his creation is? A moment's thought reminds us that no, obviously not. Don't overlook what the Bible says about God being timeless. Psalm 90 verse 2. You don't have to look it up. It says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If we'd been reading our Old Testaments, we would have seen that. If we'd been paying attention, we would have not overlooked that. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, Psalm 90 verse 2 says. He is God of the past, God of the present, and God of the future, all at the same time. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, it's my, one of my favorite books of the Bible, and we will be preaching a series, it'll actually be three series through the book of Revelation, starting... Lord willing in 2017, but I'm not making any promises yet. Uh, But Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says this about Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. He's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's obviously symbolic. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Did you notice that? Who is and who was and who is to come. He's in the past, he's in the present, and he's in the future at the same time. With the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So Jesus called himself I Am, using the personal name of Yahweh from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. And when Jesus said that, shockingly, the people that he said that to did not say, oh, what, do you, what does that mean, I am? You are what? They didn't, they didn't misunderstand him. They perfectly understood him because they picked up stones to kill him. They understood what he was saying was incredibly inappropriate unless it's true. Jesus said, I am, relating to his timelessness. And to follow that up, he said, back when Abraham was... Abraham had been dead for a long time, like 1,400 years or something. He said, back when Abraham was, I am. Kind of blows your mind. 
you see what Jesus is saying there? Jesus is saying, not in his human nature, but as the Son of God, he can experience talking to the Pharisees and being with Abraham someday back 1,400 years ago at the same time for him in his experience. Is this hard to understand? He created time. What is time? Time is a succession of moments. It's really all it is. It's the second hand on your watch. Okay, before there were cell phones, there were wristwatches. <laughs> and before there were digital wristwatches that had a number printed out on the screen, there were analog wristwatches, and there was a little hand, and the littlest hand was seconds, and it went tick, 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 like that one. <laughs> Time is a succession of ticks. Time is when something happens and then something else happens and then something else happens. It's events strung together. And we can measure how long they take and we call that time. If there's no space where there is nothing, then nothing happens. Therefore, there is no time where there is no space. So before the Lord said, let there be light, before he created the cosmos and brought everything that exists into existence, there was nothing except God and nothing ever happened that could be measured by time. So as soon as there was a creation, there was time and there will be time forevermore because the Lord has promised there will always be a universe. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So every moment... We read in Colossians, we read in John, every moment depends on Christ upholding the universe, upholding his creation by the word of his power. Every moment, time depends on Christ, not the other way around. With the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He is not bound by time. He is never controlled by time. Jesus never changes. He is never surprised by something that happens to him. And he exists not only in time by his sovereign graciousness, but also above and apart from time as Lord of the universe. He exists over it in a way we cannot fathom. We can't relate to it because it's so far out of our experience. He is God. That's what verse 8 means. If we read the Old Testament and we read the New Testament, we must not look, overlook this fact. He is God and therefore he is timeless. He's not late. He will arrive precisely when he intends. So verse 9 adds a little bit more about Jesus. Not only that he is timeless, but that he is patient. Look with me at verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Hmm. Interesting verse, hey? Let me ask you first. It says something about knowing Jesus, what he's like, that he's patient, right? Would you agree with me that's the main focus of this verse? You need to know, not only that Lord, what time is like for him, but that he is patient. Notice what it says next. He is patient what? Oh, he is patient toward you. That's a totally different statement. He is patient in his nature, but this is particularly telling us something about how he relates to us, or whoever you are in this verse. He is patient toward you. If we hold on to that, that corrects a really, really super duper common misunderstanding about this verse. He is patient toward you. Who are the you that he is writing to? <laughs> Forgive the bad rhyme and the bad grammar. Who are the you that he is writing to? How do you know it's believers? He's writing a letter to the church. That's good. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith 
of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ to those who have have obtained faith, not who have begun to believe, but who have received their faith, the Greek word means, who have received their faith by the righteousness of Jesus Christ to those who believe because Jesus gave you faith is what it's saying in verse 1 there. Look at verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord who know Jesus Christ. So Peter is writing to a group of Christians scouted around Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, Pontus, and somewhere else in Turkey today. And he's writing to people in those churches who particularly have received faith through the righteousness of Jesus and who know him. The Lord is patient toward you those people. And today this applies to us. If we are a Christian church and if there are Christians among us who have received faith because of the righteousness of Jesus and we know him, it applies to us too. So to whom is the Lord patient? To those believers who know Jesus that are in this church as were in the churches that Peter wrote to way back then. Does that make sense? Okay, we're doing great. Moving on then. Moving on then. We need to ask a question about this. Is this teaching that God will save anyone in the world or even that God wishes he could save everyone in the world? Do you see verse 9? See why I asked that? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Not wishing that any should perish. Any of what? Any animals? Any Ferrari motor cars? Any what? Zebras? Any what? Any of you? The people that he is patient to. Which people? The believers who have received faith through the righteousness of Jesus and know him in local churches, if it applies to us. So the Lord is not wishing that any of you should perish. Are you okay with that? It is what the words say. If you see a flaw in my logic, according to this verse, don't tell me now, but grab me after the service or send me an email because if I see that you're right and I've misunderstood this verse, I will publicly correct myself next week. I challenge you, however, to check this out and see is not this what this verse is teaching? That the Lord is not willing that any of you the people to whom he is patient, the people to whom he has given faith and who know him in the local church. He's not willing that any of you should perish. Well, there's one thing I left out. It's a small thing, but also according to chapter 1. Peter says down in chapter 1, verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. To make your calling and election sure. In other words, there are people who have been called to be Christians. That's why you're here. That's why you have received faith in him. That's why you know him. There are people who have been elected, which isn't talking about that thing going on on Tuesday south of the border. It's talking about, in a much more holy way, it's talking about those people whom Christ has chosen to be his people. He has elected us. If we have obtained faith, if we know him, He has elected us. He has chosen us. So there are people who will be among us who aren't yet if they've been chosen by Christ. And we don't know who they are. We certainly must never presume to know who they are and treat someone as if he's marked and he's not. No, that would be presuming to be the judge and Christ alone is the judge. We're going to get to that again in a few minutes at the end of the sermon. So, Peter is writing about the Lord's patience towards the believers in the Christian church and those who are going to be believers in the local Christian churches all over the world and how God is patient toward these people not wishing to lose any of them. No one who's on the guest list is going to be missed. That's what Christ is saying. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying rather through Peter's pen. No one who's on the guest list is going to be lost. We're not going to leave without them so to speak. Jesus said something very similar, and Peter seems to be, I think, um, remembering the teaching of Christ. 
uh, especially in John 17, 12 and John 6, 39 to 40. In fact, I'll read uh, John 6, 39 to 40. And you see how similar this is to what Jesus himself taught. In verse 39, it says, And this is the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus speaking. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but will raise it up on the last day. That's a wonderful word of scripture. I'm not going to lose anyone the Father has given me, but I will raise him up or her up on the last day. What a great promise. And the next verse says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Oh, there we go. Thank you. There we, I knew it was coming. I, I thought we can't read that and not say praise God, which in Hebrew is hallelujah. Every soul Jesus saves is saved because Jesus chose them, died for them, made his gospel known to them so that they could know him forever. And he will not come back until every last one of them has been turned to him. He's not willing to lose any of them. He's not willing that any of them should perish. He's going to make sure every last one comes in. Because he loves you. Look with me to see the love of Christ through his servant Peter in this passage. Just let me briefly show you verse 1. Chapter one, chapter 3 verse 1 I mean. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. Beloved. Look at verse 8. The verse we began with this morning. Do not overlook this one fact. Beloved. Look at verse 14. Just so that you can let this sink in how the Lord, through his apostle, feels about you. Verse 13. But it, or sorry, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, Jesus is timeless. Jesus is patient. And Jesus loves us. That's why he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, no, do you love me? Peter said, yes, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Like, why are you, keep, why are you asking me this? And the Lord said to him, feed my sheep. Because I love them too. Jesus is also righteous. Verse 7 implies that Jesus is coming to judge the world. And three times in the New Testament scriptures, we learn that Jesus himself has been appointed by God to one day judge the entire human race. Acts 10, 42, 2 Timothy 4, 1, and 1 Peter 4, 5. And if you want my sermon notes afterwards, you can email them and I'll give them to you. So Jesus has been appointed by God to judge the entire human race, to judge the world. So Jesus is a righteous judge. He is timeless. He is patient. He is righteous. Well, he is loving and he is righteous. On that day, when Jesus will judge the earth, he will judge it thoroughly. He will judge the earth completely. Literally, no stone left unturned in his examination of the works and the deeds of humankind upon the planet that we have been thinking all along belonged to us. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. I believe the better manuscripts say burned up. If we know Jesus, we need to know a little bit from Scripture about what he's like. We also need to know what his return will be like. Peter mainly focuses here on the judgment aspects of the second coming of Christ. There's a whole lot more to be said about the rescue, about the salvation revealed fully on that day, about the resurrection of the saints and the eternal joy of living with the Lord forevermore in paradise. There's a whole lot said in scripture about all the wonderful things that come about on that day that we must look forward to. But this passage focuses primarily on the judgment aspects of that day. 
because Peter is responding to the danger that scoffers and false teachers present to the Lord's people, present to true Christians. We're in danger because of scoffers and because of false teachers that we may be, we might be, through their influence, dissuaded from the Christian faith. So he's concerned and he's responding in kind with a word of caution about what are the consequences of scoffing? What are the consequences of denying our master who bought us? That's why the judgment focus here. The Holy Spirit had shown Peter that in the future, these false teachers and scoffers would be a danger to the people that Jesus has chosen. Chapter 2, 1, and chapter 3, verse 3. Eight different prophets in the Old Testament predicted the day of the Lord, the phrase Peter uses here. It might be more prophets than that, but that's all I found on a quick search. Eight different prophets I found predicting the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, says Obadiah. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 15. Peter is talking about this day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the second coming of Christ as righteous judge. In verse 10, Peter seems to draw from the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24 and its parallels in Mark and Luke, Matthew 24, 42 to 51, comparing his coming to the way a robber is unexpected when he breaks into your home. I, I guarantee you, if you've ever been broken into, you didn't plan it in your calendar. It was not scheduled. It was unexpected. You weren't ready for it. That's the point of comparison Jesus gave in Matthew 24 and Peter is giving us likewise in verse 10. When Jesus comes back, the nations of the earth will be completely unprepared. They will be absolutely surprised by his sudden return. Not ready for the consequences of the return of the king to judge the earth. In that portion of Matthew in chapter 24, when Jesus prophesied of his return, he talked about coming back like a thief. Not that he's going to steal, but that his coming is like a thief comes. How it would seem like he is delayed and how faithful believers would keep on serving the master knowing that he's coming, but unbelievers wouldn't pay any attention at all. And Peter touches on those same points. How the Lord's coming will be like a thief. How he seems to have been delayed and how faithful believers must act and be ready and live our lives while we wait for him. Peter seems to be drawing on Matthew 24 and his parallels. And this means that it is not faithful believers, but rebellious unbelievers who will be caught unprepared by the Lord's coming. For them it will be sudden, like a thief's. For them it will be final. Some scholars... And we see this in the ESV study Bible notes. Sadly, it's one of the points that I am not pleased with about that wonderful study Bible. But we see this in the notes, and some scholars think that what Peter is predicting is not a final end to the universe, a total destruction of the universe, but merely an exposing, a sort of a bearing followed by a renewal. The thing is here that Peter borrows heavily from how the day of the Lord is predicted in Isaiah and Micah and Amos and Joel and Nahum. And the language of all the prophets about this day of the Lord is final and universal. 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation 20 give a detailed picture of what that day will be like, a more detailed picture of what that day of the Lord's return will be like, adding more information than Peter sees fit to give us at this time. How the Lord will come, he will arrive, he will judge, and he will rule over the earth before he destroys this world and makes a new universe. Now, I'm convinced this is the right teaching of scripture. Again, you are free to challenge me on it. We have room for some disagreement about the, the details to follow the Lord's return, as long as we agree on the Lord's return. Okay? If you're more um, in, uh, sort of educated on these things of the doctrines of the end time, if you're an amillennial, you're welcome here. If you're a postmillennial, you're welcome here. <laughs> uh, if you're a premillennial, as I am, you're welcome here. Whether you're a historicist, idealist, dispensationalist, you're welcome here. Let's focus on interpreting the scripture properly as we go forward, agreeing together on the finality and the suddenness of the Lord's return. Amen? Amen.
Okay. Wow, that was a lot of big words. Let's move on. <laughs> Peter doesn't mention Christ ruling this world. It's kind of interesting here. Because he's focused on the aspect of judging the world. Particularly with regard to those people that would be a danger to the Christian church. Scoffers and false teachers. He's not focused here on how Christ will liberate creation and heal what Adam broke so long ago. It's in the Bible, it's just not right here in total. But as Paul prophesied in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 and 25, Paul said, Then comes the end. After Christ's return, then comes the end. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. I believe that's the process of time after the Lord's return. After the first initial judgment. See, the Big Bang... It's interesting how people's heads go up when you mention the Big Bang in church. The Big Bang was not how the universe began, but it is how the universe ends. Look with me at verse 10. I said that because the the universe began with a word. Not a bang, a word. Okay? Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away. How? With a bang. With a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up. The elements, that is all the parts of the heavenly bodies, the galaxies, the stars, the planets will burn and perish. And everything on earth that we have built, because notice it moves from outer space to down here, right home. It looks at the earth and what's upon the earth. Everything that we have built, the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, the White House, (laughs) every museum of art, Every love letter, every nursery, every statue, every monument to great men and women, every dream home, every vacation home, every RV, you better believe it, every new car, every trophy girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse, every bucket list will be burned up. The end of verse 10, according to the New American Standard and King James Version, I agree with that translation. The ESV says exposed. It's hotter than that. But there will be a myriad crowd on that day seeing Jesus return. There will be thousands of thousands of millions of millions from every race and language upon this earth we see in the book of Revelation who will stand in that fearsome day of the Lord, who will stand in that fearsome day of the Lord and they will not be burned up. They will stand, they will survive, they will weather that storm because they know Jesus and are known by him. Feels like another amen. Amen. Which leads to the question, if we know what Jesus is like, and we know what his return will be like, at least in part as Peter tells us, there's much more in the scripture. What should we be like? Look with me at verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Since everything that we are tempted to live for now is going to burn up, Everything that we are tempted to live for now is going to be destroyed. Peter asks, therefore, to think carefully about what our behavior is going to be like. Would we really work hard for, like, Canadian pesos if they were useless and just, like, not even worth the paper they're printed on? And we we work hard and store them up and bank them away, and then we go to cash in at the end of our working at retirement, and it's worthless? Would we do that if we knew? I use Canadian pesos because I thought it was running, you know, less risk of offending anyone. What sort of people ought we to be like? The Greek word behind that, what sort of people, was used in ancient Greek literature to ask what country a foreigner is from because it looks strange. It, it stands out to you as out of the ordinary and you see something and you go... What's that all about? That's this word here, what sort. What's that all about? And Peter is saying that what should stand out is the behavior of Christians, how we live until the end of the world. 
what our lives are like in holiness and godliness, holiness, like we are set apart for God's purposes, that we have a purpose, we're part of a plan, and that we love the Lord who is returning. Godliness, like knowing Jesus, changes everything and affects every part of our lives. We live out of reverence for him because of who he is, because we know him. Look with me at verse 12. Holiness, godliness, people being changed because we know Jesus and people who are patient. Verse 12. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Peter's not just coming back to the destruction of the world because he's kind of wandering in his train of thought. He's got a point to saying it now. If we're waiting to bank the good stuff, if we're saving up the real currency that will last forever, then when we cash it in, it will be when everything else is gone. That's why he's bringing up the end of the world again in this verse. I like how vivid this is. I like the, the strong, bold, graphic picture if we can remember that everything in the world is going to be destroyed, that literally nothing will last, why would we set our hopes on what we can get and experience now? Envy, bitterness, unforgiveness because I felt somebody owed me something I didn't get. Feeling that there is something we want or deserve that someone else has or that isn't ours and we want it. Like Gollum. And it's that awful. It's that foolish if we saw it from the Lord's point of view. Feeling like we can't be happy now unless we scratch that itch. But if what we crave literally won't last, then I promise you it can't satisfy us for long either. A few moments, and then we need another fix. So we learn by knowing Jesus more, we learn to retrain our appetites for that which lasts forever. Brothers and sisters, I'm pleading with you as Peter pleads with us and is trying to stir us up by way of reminder. This is a plea that we would retrain our appetites for that which lasts forever. Store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For that which still satisfies us 10,000 years from now, we wait for it patiently. I should say this we wait for Him patiently. But at the same time, we wait patiently, eagerly anticipating, and we do everything we can to hurry it up. You just look at the irony of verse 12 waiting for implies patience, and hastening implies impatience. It's both in the Christian heart. Waiting for and hastening. God knows when that day will be. It's in his calendar, as Jesus said. He said, concerning that day and hour, the Father knows. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. It's in his calendar. He will be right on time. But it's also true that the reason Jesus hasn't come back yet is because he is patient toward us. Toward us. And towards those who still need to be with us. In every local church around the world that still preaches the gospel still knows Jesus. Where there is real faith still. There are still others who need to come in. He is patient towards us, waiting until every last patient, uh, sorry, every last person on his guest list reaches repentance. Verse 8 says, The implication is here, verse 9, I mean, the implication is here that we can live our lives and spend the time that remains playing a part in God's plan of redemption to bring people to him. He, He doesn't need us, but he uses us. It's not about us, it's about his gospel, but it's preached through us. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The more believers, I think Peter is saying, that radically devote themselves to helping people know the coming king, the sooner it will turn out that his scheduled return is. Waiting for and hastening until every last one is in. 
as I learned somewhere from the writings of Henry Grattan Guinness. You can look him up. The more that we love Jesus, the more we will long for him to come back. How's that for logic? The more that we love him, the more we will long for him to come back. And the more we long for him to come back, the more we will look forward to seeing him. Him. And the more we will look forward to seeing him, the more we will spend our lives doing whatever we can to help others know him too, because it means he's coming sooner. Waiting for and hastening the day of our Lord. Why? Why would we act like that and live like that? It's because we know him. Look at verse 13. But, according to his promise... Whose promise? It's the Jesus we know. The Lord we have discovered who has shown himself to us. The Lord we have come to trust and rely on and depend on with all of our confidence. The Lord we long for and miss whom we haven't seen but we know somehow we were created to know him forever. According to his promise. Sorry, I was kind of getting eloquent there. According to his promise we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's because we know Jesus that we have no doubt about his promise to come again. He said to his disciples, I will come again. Jesus promised that in John 14, 3. I will come again. He's not a liar. We know that. We've learned that about him. He's not unreliable. We know that. We've learned that about him in the scripture, right? He's not too weak to keep his promise. We know that. We've learned that about him in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's not forgetful. We know that about him, don't we? He is God. If you and I pour over the Gospels and we learn what Jesus is like, if we read the Old Testament prophecies about him and we discover in the books of history the holy, righteous, good, and trustworthy character of Yahweh, born as a human baby that day so long ago in Bethlehem, as we see in the history of the Old Testament his righteous dealings with the nations of the earth and his patient, tender mercy, long-suffering, and discipline of his nation Israel, if we find in Genesis and in the genealogies his incredible plan to use one family all the way through one family tree to bring the world a Savior who is Christ the Lord, If we see that plan worked out and we read in the poetic books and the wisdom literature, the praiseworthy majesty, power, and divine understanding of the Lord, his wisdom. If we grasp from the end times prophecies of Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and John's revelation, the perfect strategy and the ultimate victory that ends with the final unveiling, the revealing, the apocalypse of Christ the King of the universe, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, so that every eye will see him and every knee will bow before him. If we do all of that, and we know him like that, then because he himself has given us his word, I will come again. Then according to his promise, we will wait for him. And not just wait for him, but for the way his presence will change the world. Look at that verse. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Genesis 1.1, the first verse in the Bible, says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's a Hebrew way of saying everything, everything up there and everything down there and everything in between. The universe we have from English or whatever language it comes from, probably Latin. And we see here in verse 13 that Jesus will recreate the universe when he comes. A new heavens and a new earth, a new universe. It will not turn out like it did with Adam and Eve and the virgin earth. It will not be vulnerable to rebellion. It will not be simply pure. It will be perfected. Everything that is wrong with this world will finally be right. It will be put right. Don't you long for that day? 
Every lack will be filled. Every ache will be healed. Every hunger will be satisfied. Every sorrow will be comforted. Every justice will be realized. On that day, and every grace supplied. On that day. Isn't that day of the Lord worth waiting for? Whatever tempts you now, whatever wrong you were thinking of committing, isn't that day of the Lord worth waiting for instead? As Paul cries out in what we must describe as rapturous expectation, he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are still alive, who are left until his coming, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air as he comes, to meet him in the air, his welcoming party. And so we will ever be with the Lord. And Paul says this, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Kevin, pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as with all the scripture that you've given us to teach and to preach and to proclaim, to believe and to take into us and to remember. But with this passage in particular, as you've put it on my heart and you've arranged it this week, that this would be where we are in the sermon series and this would be the gathering of people to hear and dwell on these words. I ask, Father, counting on the promise of Jesus Christ, counting on the power of the Holy Spirit, counting on the sovereign will and initiating of your plan, that this word would, will not return empty or void, but it would accomplish in us what you intended it to accomplish. So stir up faith, Father. Give us eyes to see who Jesus Christ is and hearts to love him that we might know him. Give us patience, Lord, and eagerness that as we wait for, we will also hasten the day of the Lord's return and we will know your word. We will sink it deep into our hearts and minds. We will dwell on your scripture because it's life to us. And we will hope for and look forward to that day when we will be with your son forever. Amen.